Hi, everyone. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone else. Uh, so um, I think a lot of uh, what I'm trying to, what I'm going to talk about has been discussed uh, quite a bit uh, today by uh, various uh, people. And uh, in a sense, they, uh, it's a primer to, to what uh, it is that we want to do. Um, maybe I should explain what is the uh, explanation of the slogan, mirror your mind. Uh, the idea is to be a mirror to your mind so that one could look at a virtual mirror and will actually see their Just brain activity. We started, we're on in 35 minutes, and if you I'll can get... Right Someone else? Uh, we can do two talks together, it's no problem. <laughs> anyway, so that's really the idea, namely to, be, to provide a very good neural feedback. That's really the idea. And at this point, we are developing you know, the assessment in order to be a good neural feedback. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are uh, quite familiar with the horrors of brain deterioration, uh, which is uh, potentially worse than anything else, uh, because this is a disease that is now stay staying. You know, once you get it, it's not like you take antibiotics for 10 days or it's a cancer, you either get out of it or you die. You can stay for many years with this uh, in a very, very uh, debilitating state. And uh, this is uh, uh, something that I've seen personally on my grandparents, uh, and I've seen it on, on many other people. And if I could do a little dent in that, I would really feel extremely uh, satisfied. Um, so if we look at the current uh, status quo, there's no need to read all these things. The whole idea is that the machines that are doing brain scanning are big, uh, uh, not uh, easy uh, to use. Uh, clearly, you cannot take them home. Nobody's walking with an fMRI on their head. Uh, clearly, they cannot be done at home and very expensive. Uh, and this is uh, what I think if we could change, uh, uh, we should. And the idea is not to build something that is as good as this, uh, but uh, it is to build something that is good enough and potentially better than this. Uh, so here's uh, our approach, uh, and for those of you who heard my talk uh, before, I used to concentrate on uh, the left side. Uh, I'm actually going to concentrate on the right-hand side. Uh, one of the reasons is that due to Oren, who is sitting here, uh, the hardware is in very good shape, uh, and we have uh, frozen the hardware, and this is one of the reasons why we got uh, FDA listing. Uh, and uh, now we are uh, really uh, improving our biomarkers, and I'm going to be talking about uh, biomarkers uh, most of uh, the time, and talking about the way we uh, ping the brain. We actually uh, try to interrogate the brain in order to get uh, this result. And someone mentioned it uh, today here that when you want to analyze the brain, uh, it's uh, like taking a basketball player and giving him a, bo a, a ball and seeing how he prefer, uh, performs on court. Uh, if you want to sit and have coffee with that basketball player, you're not going to learn much about him. This is what fMRI and all these EEG uh, devices are doing. And of course, uh, uh, we want to change that by a very simple device that can interrogate the brain. Uh, as I mentioned, we are focusing on cognitive decline. You know, once you kind of create a new brain activity representation, there's a lot of things that you can do, uh, but you have to stay focused because otherwise uh, nothing works. Uh, so we are focusing on those uh, for uh, three reasons. Uh, one, it's of course a very big problem and uh, uh, unmet uh, need and uh, there's a lot of money in it. Two, we have very good results there. And three, kind of, uh, we don't have too many competitors uh, in, in, in our uh, direct uh, area, as opposed to concussion, for example, or other uh, areas. So for those of you who kind of hear my analogy uh, first time, and I'm going to have just two more slides that you may have seen before, and that's it. Uh, basically, one of the mistakes uh, is that uh, fMRI created this understanding that in order to understand the brain, you have to understand the geography. You have to know where every uh, uh, um, uh, functional neural brain is in the brain, and this is what will 
make you understand the brain, but this is totally, totally wrong, unfortunately. Uh, for example, uh, the amygdala, which is a very small uh, nucleus in the center of the brain, uh, the size of an almond, uh, when it is uh, uh, active, about 40% of the brain is active. So you cannot really talk about a very specific area that is active. You can talk about a network, a big network that is active. And this is what we are trying to understand, to understand those networks. And the analogy is to listen to an orchestra with a single ear. Uh, you can actually hear all the uh, musical instruments and you, then you decompose them in your brain in order to actually uh, distinguish the different musical instruments. And of course, we can distinguish very well between a trumpet and a violin if we just wanted to distinguish based on what's called spectral analysis or the frequency band, we could not do that. But using higher harmonics of uh, uh, the uh, sound uh, enables us to do that. Now you can imagine that the brain that has a chorus of 100 billion neurons is producing a very sophisticated music and therefore it requires a very sophisticated harmonic analysis in order to interpret it and this is really uh, the novelty here. So uh, it all started from the work of Ronald Kaufman uh, in Yale and uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to uh, work with him and to be around at that time and then even to slightly modify it and this is what we're using to uh, interpret the brain. I'm going to be talking about two different, two, two biomarkers, only two biomarkers, and uh, let me just uh, show you uh, uh, where they are. Uh, so uh, VC6 uh, is, uh, used to be called F3. If you saw in the slides uh, that uh, were presented by uh, Cassidy this morning, the work of, uh, of Carla Pugh on the, neuros on the surgeons, uh, it was still called F3. We changed finally the name F3 because it's very confusing with the location, the EEG location, uh, F3. Uh, and VC9 used to be called C4. Uh, and that's, um, so VC9 is basically an executive. VC6 is uh, uh, working memory uh, kind of biomarker. And of course, you don't have to believe me, but that's really what we are trying to validate. And that's uh, kind of what I'm going to be uh, talking about today. So from now, we'll just see slides of uh, these biomarkers. Uh, so how do, we uh, how do we analyze, how do, do we validate this? Uh, VC9, uh, basically, uh, we start with a very well uh, uh, validated program, the NBEC, uh, where you have to kind of remember a sequence of numbers. Uh, and it's very easy to increase uh, the difficulty by increasing uh, the number of numbers that you have to remember. Uh, but we want to make it more pleasant to uh, uh, the subjects and we switch to musical end back and we get great feedback from uh, subjects and patients that this is much more uh, pleasant for them to, to do. It also activates the brain more, so it enables us to, uh, to do that. When we are dealing with uh, more severe patients uh, with traumatic brain injury, then uh, the, the detection uh, um, uh, of uh, musical instruments or any other detection is a little easier. Both of them have been validated uh, uh, with uh, cognitive decline, uh, uh, MCI, etc. Uh, and uh, what we have uh, found uh, uh, kind of by chance is that resting state is extremely important. Uh, now, a lot of people are talking about resting state, but we uh, see that, one, we can measure resting state very well, and uh, two, uh, that it provides a beautiful separation between groups of uh, healthy subjects and patients, and uh, that's why uh, uh, we are focused on that. So this is the kind of things I'm going to be showing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the, the uh, NBEC uh, has been uh, shown to be very useful uh, for uh, predicting MCI. Our goal is to detect as early as possible a cognitive decline. Why? Because there are things that can be done. There are four things that can be done. It would be uh, nutrition, change your nutrition, reduce uh, inflammatory agents uh, in your uh, body, uh, better sleep, um, hopefully uh, uh, long uh, uh, stage four sleep, uh, physical activity, extreme uh, physical activity, and reduction of stress. And when a doctor tells a patient, you know what, 
you really uh, have it, and now it's a matter of time until you uh, really will not be able to recognize your loved ones, people actually do change and do uh, uh, start uh, uh, behaving differently. And so if we can detect that as early as possible, we can, of course, change the course of this disease, and this is our goal. Okay, so uh, let's look at what happens with uh, uh, simple end back uh, with uh, simple numbers. Uh, so this is a project uh, with uh, Professor Dominique Lamy and uh, Neta Maimon, who is a PhD student of Dominique and myself and also uh, working at uh, Neurosteer. Uh, and then um, it's quite obvious when we increase the cognitive load, uh, by increasing the numbers uh, that have to uh, be remembered, uh, we see uh, in this biomarker VC9, we see an increase in activity of, uh, this, of this biomarker, and the increase is significant and everyone is happy. Okay? Uh, Non-trivial, actually, but uh, this is what we see. Uh, in a second, we'll see that this is very different uh, with uh, patients. Uh, what happens when you do the same uh, kind of uh, uh, test but with, uh, uh, with uh, musical uh, 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 testing. Then there's an increase in uh, the what's called NBEC uh, zero uh, because people are suddenly hearing these musical instruments for the first time and that kind of excites them. So we have a difference in the first uh, uh, row, uh, but um, sorry, the first column, but then uh, level one, two, and three actually behave exactly the same uh, as uh, before. So as I said, this is with uh, healthy uh, subjects. Uh, and then uh, for uh, the auditory detection that I mentioned, um, again, this is uh, a well-validated uh, way to uh, test the brain and to uh, predict uh, cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, and uh, we do uh, that, uh, uh, we'll go, I'm going to skip this, and uh, we'll go immediately to the results. Uh, so again, the same VC9, okay? Uh, in uh, detection, we have only two levels. We found it to be enough uh, for our purposes, so usually the tests are a little bit uh, easier, and again, we use them for the more uh, severe cases uh, of uh, patients. Uh, and again, when the detection is more difficult, we see an increase in the activity of that biomarker. Now, what happens when we go to resting state, when we uh, actually uh, try to inflict uh, resting uh, on those patients? So looking not at all of the brain, no, not looking at the big network of default mode network or resting but looking just at this same biomarker, VC9, when we are at, at rest, okay? Uh, and we can inflict rest uh, by three different methods, and we actually do that, what we call the active way, when we have to concentrate and try to reduce our breathing rate and concentrate on our breathing, uh, the passive way, when we listen to uh, meditative music, uh, and uh, the more difficult way, which is mindfulness, where we are trying to actually uh, take any thought out of our brain. Uh, those who meditate uh, for many years do that very easily. For others, it is more difficult, uh, but we uh, try uh, both all these three uh, for uh, resting. So the important point is, uh, and probably not surprising, is that if we compare the activity of VC9 during the difficult detection and also during the easy detection to the activity of VC9 during meditation, then of course the activity of VC9 is reduced. In a sense, there is a conductor to the orchestra and that conductor reduces the activity of, let's say, this group of musical instruments that has to do with VC9 when there's no cognitive challenge required them to be active. Uh, that conductor is actually going away sometimes uh, when uh, we are talking about uh, cognitive decline of uh, various sorts. Uh, so that's how uh, it looks uh, uh, with uh, um, elderly patients. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, the result that we will see. So take the same VC9, okay? On the left, we see the healthy ones. We see cognitive uh, activity of this biomarker goes up uh, as the challenge goes up and going down as uh, we are moving to rest, totally different 
when we are looking at cognitively impaired, okay? Two things are different. One, uh, it's not going up as the cognitive challenge is uh, bigger. And two, it is not going down as the cognitive challenge is reduced to rest, okay? Kind of like there's no conductor uh, in uh, the orchestra. And we really found that uh, measuring the difference between the activity of VC9 during the big cognitive challenge and the activity of VC9 during a uh, uh, resting state uh, is actually providing the most sensitive uh, separator between this group, uh, group uh, of uh, patients uh, and healthy uh, subjects. So this is one of the outcome biomarkers uh, that we are using, this uh, uh, difference between them. And as you can see now, there's no need to scale because everyone is, is a, a baseline for himself. So I'm looking at the same activity under two different challenges and uh, looking at this difference. And as I mentioned before, this is something that's very difficult to do in functional MRI because it's very difficult to challenge really the brain during a functional MRI session. We can do it very easily with this device. We can do it at home. We can do it in the clinic. We can do it uh, everywhere. What's more important is that this enables us to provide a ranking of subjects based on this difference and other uh, differences. So uh, the red group is actually healthy subjects. And for the red group, we see mostly that this difference is positive. For some of them, the difference is very high. For others, the difference is lower. Uh, and when we are looking at uh, the group of patients, we see then uh, that their behavior is different. For some of them, uh, the value is still high, but most of them, actually, the values are negative. Okay, so that provides a beautiful separation uh, between uh, uh, those uh, uh, healthy and uh, patients. I mentioned Parkinson, but we do the same with Alzheimer's. We do the same with frontotemporal dementia. Uh, we actually see that uh, in, in different groups uh, of patients quite, uh, quite nicely. Uh, so this morning, you've seen that project uh, of uh, the surgeons uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, but not from the viewpoint uh, that uh, uh, was presented this morning during the surgery. I'm actually going to be talking about uh, the cognitive uh, test uh, that was done uh, there. Uh, what I'm showing here is a slightly uh, different biomarker based on, on VC9 uh, that is a very good separator between uh, the MMSE group 24, uh, less than 24 and above 24. Um, basically, some people say that above 24, uh, these are healthy. I would just consider 30 to be healthy, but that's the current uh, story. We see here very good, uh, very good uh, difference between these two groups. And I just put the surgeons here for, uh, for uh, uh, comparison. You see that the rest is even going up further, which means that uh, the brain actually cannot control at all uh, this uh, thing. Uh, here's one graph in the case of Alzheimer's, uh, this uh, biomarker uh, uh, as, uh, with comparison to mini-mental uh, test. Uh, we all know that mini-mental is, is a very poor test, and uh, we hope to provide a much better uh, testing uh, based on this kind of objective uh, biomarkers. Uh, a couple of more slides to show uh, other things uh, that we uh, do because in the case of uh, uh, neurodegenerative sleep is disrupted dramatically uh, and with our device, uh, with our uh, simple sensor, we have full uh, hypnogram. Uh, so that helps kind of monitoring those patients in the evening for cognition and emotion and then monitoring them at night uh, for full uh, sleep uh, hypnogram. So I mentioned that I'm going to talk a little bit about this project. And for us, this project was interesting for a for few more reasons. Uh, one, we were collecting the data in a very busy conference during three days where people were totally disrupted by the conference and the people that they see, etc. And still, they could sit down quietly, uh, although there was a lot of noise around, 
put earphones and spend time with our little device and uh, 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 provide us with cognitive assessment without any problem. And collecting 250 people in three days was uh, clearly uh, 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 not uh, difficult at all. Uh, two, uh, basically no one of them was complaining that this device that we put on the forehead and behind the ear was actually disrupting them in performing the operation, etc. I'm sure that if I would put an fMRI on their head or a 256 electrode EEG or maybe even 16 electrode EEG, that would be much more uh, disruptive than this, these electrodes. This is how they were sitting and doing uh, the cognitive test with earphones listening with a clicker like this in their hand for performance and actually uh, doing their stuff. So since these are healthy subjects, uh, there's no uh, surprise that their results be behaved like uh, the other subjects that we had. Uh, so uh, the end back is going up. Uh, we, of course, uh, see the difference. Uh, here we wanted to separate, and VC6 is the, uh, the cognitive, not the executive, as I mentioned, but you saw the executive this morning. Uh, here we wanted to separate between uh, the young surgeons and the retired surgeons. Uh, and so if we take the non-retired surgeons uh, out, uh, we actually get uh, uh, even sharper uh, distinction. When we do take the retired, uh, when we do look at the retired surgeons, and unfortunately we had only uh, 12 such subjects, again, we see the same result that uh, there's no real change in uh, uh, when we are increasing the end back, and in fact, it even goes down when uh, the result is more difficult. So going back to trying to build something that will really democratize brain activity in the sense that will enable us to read brain activity everywhere uh, and in, under every condition, we uh, had uh, a much bigger challenge just three days after uh, the cognitive uh, uh, test that we did um, uh, in Stanford. Uh, in San Francisco, and here we were monitoring two marathon runners uh, for the New York Marathon uh, with uh, our device. Uh, my outcome from uh, monitoring them and actually running after them around the marathon to see that everything is fine was that I have to run a marathon because the energy was just amazing, so hopefully I, I will do that. Uh, but from uh, their viewpoint, we overcame uh, several uh, difficult, uh, cervical di difficult problems, okay? One, we uh, showed that we are not sensitive to motion artifacts. We are not sensitive to muscle artifacts. We are not sensitive to the sweat uh, that occurred there. And we were not sensitive to the thousands of Bluetooth devices and cellular devices that were all around there. Uh, and we could still reliably transfer the data uh, to uh, the cloud. Uh, so this is Professor Stephen Lowry's, uh, who is uh, one of the leading uh, people in uh, the world in uh, coma uh, from Liège. Uh, we uh, do work on coma, but as you can see, he takes this uh, device um, with his, uh, with, uh, his son uh, uh, to run a marathon and with his baby to monitor the baby's uh, sleep uh, and whatnot. Uh, and, uh, what we also did is we, which was probably very dangerous, but we decided to do it. Uh, we uh, aired in real time on Facebook the whole marathon of both of them. And uh, I want to uh, talk about meditation for a second because it's relevant. So I'll say that uh, Stephen Lowry's, uh, who is a friend of the Dalai Lama, also brings us uh, different uh, uh, Lama Zopa and... Uh, and, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Mathieu Ricard to, uh, to be analyzed. Mathieu Ricard is doing uh, so-called compassion meditation. Lama Zopa is doing um, emptiness meditation, two totally different meditations. And I'm very excited that we are switching from uh, monitoring with 256 electrodes or fMRI to our device. So maybe this is leading the pack. And why do I mention this? Because um, uh, Stephen Lowry, who recently wrote a book about meditation, and now I'm sorry, this is kind of the old representation of our data, where these are 
uh, 121 different channels that we decompose out of the single EEG channel uh, that we read from. And you remember this was uh, what I called C4 or VC9. And what you see is that Stephen Lowry's was entering into a meditative state for most of uh, the, the run, whereas his uh, young son, uh, who is not experienced in meditation, was actually very, very active uh, in his brain. Now it makes sense to go into meditative state because it reduces uh, uh, consumption of oxygen in the brain. And as the oxygen is very big consumer of oxygen, this leaves more oxygen to the uh, muscles. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, useful. Here's another slide showing even deeper uh, meditation of Stephen Lowry's. And there was a lot of fun on the web. People were watching it and commenting it. Uh, and that was uh, a really uh, uh, a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, excitement. Uh, so we are starting to show that uh, we can really read uh, useful brain uh, uh, biomarkers in a very, very simple way with a very uh, inexpensive uh, device uh, when all the uh, the knowledge is applied uh, on the cloud on uh, that uh, sophisticated signal. I'll end with just uh, two slides remembering that we are in uh, the heart of the VC community. So I'll just uh, mention that uh, uh, this can impact really all stakeholders. Of course, for the patient, it can really improve uh, their condition by improving uh, treatment and improving uh, uh, early uh, detection. For the doctors, it can provide a very quick uh, uh, digital biomarkers, uh, objective biomarkers that a doctor and we are talking about the general physician can actually uh, uh, change uh, uh, treatment based on that. So if we compare ourselves to a lot of others in this field, um, what is happening now in, let's say, digital medicine, people uh, take a database, uh, even EEG database, uh, and uh, from the other shelf take a machine learning uh, a tool and run machine learning on this large database and find more, uh, uh, more uh, outcomes. Uh, what we did is we, uh, are use, we are going down to just one EEG channel, and the only way we can do that is by increasing the sensitivity of the hardware, so we cannot really use the existing databases of EEG, but with our database, with what we collect, with our sensitive hardware, we can actually uh, provide quite a bit of information uh, on the EEG. So we use signal processing, and then on top of that, we use machine learning for the same purpose of reducing the need of the neurologist, and that's what we do. Uh, of course, for the insurance companies, uh, you know, earlier detection uh, is better treatment, is less uh, cost uh, for them. Uh, but last uh, uh, and not least uh, is what we do for the drug companies. And I just put Roche here for, um, uh, as an example. Uh, basically, we can really help uh, drug companies uh, improve screening uh, because this is a much more affordable screening than any other device, and this is really what we are uh, focusing on. And we can uh, uh, help them improve uh, patients' adherence to the drug because uh, we can actually monitor them at home and there are uh, drug companies that are looking at uh, these things uh, as we speak. And uh, what's most important, this is really an immediate source of, uh, of uh, revenue for us, uh, so that's obviously something we cannot uh, ignore. Uh, I'll just say that last year was an amazing year for the company. We achieved whatever we wanted to achieve. Um, it was kind of nice to uh, get a uh, uh, Brain Health Company uh, Year Award uh, from Tradex News. Uh, and uh, there's a lot that we need to do, and uh, I would be happy uh, to talk with anyone who wants more details, who wants to join us on this ride. Thank you. I have some time for questions, so feel free, yes. What are the 
thresholds to make it abnormal. Okay, so FFT is 250 years old. Wavelet was invented in 1970. Wavelet packet analysis, what Kaufman did, was from 1990. This is what we're using. So what we're using is time frequency atoms, but very specifically uh, constructed for this specific data representation of brain activity. Okay, so not just regular wavelet, but very sophisticated wavelet done for this specific representation. That's what we are looking for. So it looks for high harmonics in the data, like a trumpet, you know, the difference between a trumpet and the violin is the little harmonics of the high uh, pitch, not, not the bass one, okay? And uh, that's what we are looking at, all right? Uh, so the... the what separates between healthy and, and uh, 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 sick patients is really the fact that they cannot control it, okay? So for some of them, man, I'm being attacked here. So for, <laughs> so for some of them, it goes down dramatically. For example, the, for example comatose patients. Uh, all the gait freezing patients, gait frozen patients, Parkinson, the activity is extremely, extremely high. And uh, in between, we, we see the different cases, and we can really separate them based on that. And I'm happy to talk more about it. Sure. Yes. Hello. <laughs> He's here. OK, go ahead. Yes. Thank you for sharing all the sure. data. Thank you. Uh, any, uh... Uh, any, any information you can share on how are you looking at correlating this to other biomarkers? Like, you know, if you have speech or voice or HRV, and how some of these biomarkers from EEG have been correlated to find either proxies or enhancers as you, you know, develop this further? Yeah, that's Thank a very you. good question. So the question is how to correlate it. Uh, so the problem is that there are no real good objective biomarkers for brain activity. I mean, for every other organ in our body, we have amazing ones. You know, if we come and we say, I think I had a heart attack, you know, there's an enzyme test, ultrasound will check your valves and will know everything about your heart in a short time. None of that is for neurological disorders and even worse for psychiatric disorders. Uh, so that kind of is a little challenging. Uh, and the goal is to find very good doctors that have quantified their patients very, very carefully. And usually that requires the big machinery. So it's PET, CT, uh, FDOPA, fMRI, understanding how to read uh, default mode network uh, and resting activity in fMRI. By the way, we are uh, devising our uh, trials so that they will be fMRI compatible so that the same patient can actually go into the fMRI and do exactly the same test so that we can really compare. Uh, in the past, I was using EEG inside the fMRI to get a gold standard. The problem with that is that EEG has to chop off a lot of the frequencies and I cannot do all the magic that we do here, but we could show, for example, in the Nature paper that we could read the amygdala, so it's not totally uh, a disaster, but that's kind of, it's a challenge to, um, to, uh, to do that, yes. But, you know, some people we compare to CSF, okay, to, to invasive tests as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you.